you know. I parked it over there. You parked what over there? That's the question. Or you parked what over there? You parked, you parked your car? You parked your, your uh, she camel? <laughs> the she camel, by the way, that's one of those words that Muslims have a monopoly over. No other, no other uh, English-speaking person of any other faith or of faithless, without faith, will ever use the word she camel ever in your life. You will never hear it. Uh, but that word belongs to us. We own that word, she camel. Right? So what did you park? Your motorcycle, your bicycle, your scooter? Uh, what exactly did you park over there? Right? Uh, we would introduce that. We would say, I parked, the, I parked my car over there, and then I moved it in the afternoon. Right? So what does it mean when we don't mention the car and we just say it? Right? It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, uh, easy example, right? very rude example, especially with respect to the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it as a reference to the Quran without having mentioned the Quran in the surah. And this is to show the exaltation that he gives, the veneration that he gives to his own speech. That it is ghaniyun an tarif It is without any need for introduction. It doesn't need introduction. Its reputation precedes it. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he revealed it on the night of Qadr, Everyone knows what he is talking about. Hmm? So this shows the exalted place that the Quran has and the veneration that we should have for it uh, that he revealed it on the night of Qadr, the night of Qadr, Laylat al Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has among the, among, among the year selected or chosen certain months as the forbidden months, the favored months. And among the months, he has chosen certain days uh, as the favored days. And among the nights, he has chosen certain nights as the favored nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and remind them about the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That these are, these are special occasions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls our attention to. وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ those who exalt the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is directly from the taqwa in their own hearts. And Laylat and Qadr is the, most, the single most important night of the entire year. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces it in this surah. This was the night that he chose for the revelation of the Qur'an to come all the way down to earth. And he asked the Prophet sallallahu وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةٌ قَدْرٌ What will make you truly fathom what the night of Qadr is? The night of Qadr. I'm not translating Qadr because it's a very difficult word to translate. It means so many different things. It's power, it's, it's apportionment, and it's also decree. Right? The night of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Qadr. Right? Uh, and to, to call it Laylatul Qadr in itself is very, very, there's, there's a lot of mystery there, right? To call it the night of decree. Uh, there's another verse in which, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubaraka fiha yufraqu kullu amrin hakim, right? That we have revealed it on a, uh, a blessed night <coughs> in which every single matter of wisdom is disseminated, right? Scholars have looked at these two verses and uh, they have assigned that verse to the, uh, the middle of Shaban. Right? That in the middle of Shaban all the decrees come down to the earth. But in Laylat and Qadr they get disseminated among the servants. They get distributed and disseminated. No. So this is one way of their interpreting that verse. Now, the Laylat al Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the Prophet sallallahu what will make you fathom the greatness of this night? And this was something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa already appreciated beyond our ability to comprehend. It's something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa already exalted in his heart 
because this was the night in which he first met his teacher. It was a very special night for the Prophet ﷺ, and a very special night. But look at how Allah SWT asked this question. What will make you understand? What will make you understand? Allah SWT is the one who makes us all understand. Allah SWT, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهُ Have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you. He will make you understand. No? But when Allah Himself says to the Prophet and Allah has all the means and all the power, Allah has the means to make the Prophet fathom it. But He doesn't give him those means. He does not give him the, 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 the full understanding of Laylat al He doesn't give it to him. Even though his knowledge was perfect, his knowledge was complete. The Prophet's knowledge was perfect. But Allah's knowledge is infinite. And from his infinite knowledge, he has the means. Allah, Allah has the means and he has the power to enable the Prophet to fully grasp the greatness of Laylat al-Qadr, and yet he does not give it, give it to him. But he gives him distinctions of the night. He gives him uh, a taste of the greatness of this night without explaining it. He says, what will make you understand? Well, Allah, you will make me understand. <laughs> you can make me understand. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give it to him. He says, Laylat al-Qadr, khayrun min al-fishan. That's what he, so he tells him, he, he tells him about the, the distinction of the night, but he's still not explaining it to him. He's still not distilling it and, and detailing everything that happens in this night and why it is so great. But he gives him a distinction. He says, later to Qadri, خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِشَانٍ The night of Qadr is better than a thousand months. And a lot of people have pulled out their calculators and right, they say, a thousand months, right? Let's say a thousand months. Say, so how do I do this now? A thousand? What do I do? A thousand? Divide by twelve. That's how you do it. They say, oh wow, 83.3333333 years is better than 83 and 33333333 years. <laughs> Right? Okay. What does that mean? If I tell you, remember, that, that's not put in my, in my words, your mother told you, everyone here grew up young, right? And their mothers at one point said, I told you a thousand, I told you a hundred times to make your bed before going to, to school. Right? No, you didn't. You might have told me seven. <laughs> you might have told me seven. No, in the past six months, I distinctly remember you telling me three times. Right? You better not say that to him. Right? You better not say that to him. But you can think it. <coughs> and perhaps many of us thought it. No, you only told me about three times. But I got it. I got the message. What does your mother mean by saying I told you a hundred times? It means that it's too much to count. It means that it's too numerous. It's, 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 it's too much to keep track of. And it's gotten me to the point of a lack of patience with you. That is so often that I've had to tell you. Right? That's what she means by a hundred. She doesn't mean one zero zero. Okay. The greatest number the Arabs had was a thousand. That's the greatest number the Arabs had. Right? There's no number after a thousand. And then they start counting thousands. How do you say a million in Arabic? You better not say million. <laughs> I better not hear somebody say million. That's not how you say million in Arabic. How do you say million in Arabic? A thousand thousands. Alf alf. Alf alf. So the greatest number the Arabs had was a thousand. And Allah takes the greatest number. And He doesn't say Laylatul Qadri to Sawi alf shahar. He doesn't say the night of Qadr equates a thousand months. That is the same. He doesn't say it's 83.3333333 years. And you have the reward of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devoting yourself and all of the dua and all of the graces that are coming, that that, that, that equates 
83.33333 years of doing that. Allah takes the greatest number and then he surpasses it by the word khair. Khairun min. He surpasses the greatest number by the word khairun min, that Laylat al-Qadr is better than your greatest number. And when Allah takes the greatest number and then he says it's better than, it's better than that, wa Allah dhul fadl al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the greatest bounty. And so, it's another way of saying it's infinitely better because it taps into his infinite bounty. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says khairun min, that khairun min taps into his infinite bounty, which is in وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا And if you were to count the graces and the blessings of your Lord, you would not be able to enumerate them. Right? You would not be able to enumerate them. So it's far better than the Azam. This one night. This one night. And Allah SWT can stretch the barakah of one night as He wills. He says, يَسُبُّ بَنُوا عَلَمَ الدَّهَرِ وَأَنَا الدَّهَرِ the, ch- the children of Adam inveigh against the vicissitudes of time. Oh, there's no time. Time flies. Oh, i got to kill time. Walter Rabbi says, you may think you're killing time while time quietly kills you. And we're constantly talking about time in this, in this fashion. The son of Adam insults and inveighs against the vicissitudes of time. And I am time. I am time. In my hand is the night and the day. And so when Allah SWT says that Laylat of Qadr is better than a thousand months, you take a thousand months and Allah SWT will put the barakah wheresoever He wants, wheresoever He wills. He'll put the barakah in one night that will surpass the barakah that He puts in a thousand months in much more than a thousand months in many, many more months than a thousand months. Mm. In that one night, in that one night, Laila Tsukhaba. Laila Tsukhaba. So it is, and Qadr is esteem also, it's estimation. Laila Tsukhaba, it's the night of value, the night of estimation, uh, the night of constriction as well. Laila Tsukhaba is a night of constriction. Look at this human being that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests him uh, and by giving him, he tests him by giving him, he says, My Lord has honored me. And and when he test him by constricting his provision upon him, qadr, qadr, by, by constricting his provision upon him, فَيَقُولُ رَبِّيَ أَهَانَ He says, my Lord has humiliated me. So this word qadr means to constrict also. And that was a night of great constriction for the Prophet Laylat al-Qadr was the night of great constriction for him. That he, that he had to seek the expansion through his wife's, through Khadija's consolation. Right? But he was constricted. Zanminuni, Zanminuni. He was constricted. He says, Inni khashitu ala nafsi. I, 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 have, I fear over myself. I fear over myself. And the Khadija says, Kalla. She says, perish the thought. Perish the thought. You are this and you are that and you are this and you are that. And there's no way that you can be a deen, that you would ever be possessed. He doesn't even say it, but she understands it. She negates what he's thinking. Kalla, stop right there, stop right there. Hmm? That was the night of great constriction for him. So Allah SWT revealed it on that night of constriction. And that was the night that Jibreen literally constricted the Prophet until, and that was not a hug. Oh, you know, he came to be nice and came into the cave and gave him a great big, great big hug, uh, gave a great big bear hug, just picked him right off his feet and said, hey, man, I'm missing you. <laughs> Nothing like that, no. Allamahu shadidul quwa, the one who was endowed with great strength, taught him. Angels, we, th- we have this Hollywood sort of um, imagery whenever we're thinking about angels, that they're little, 
that there's these little cherubims with their with their arrows, right? That go around, you know, uh, matchmaking, right? Cupid. Right? A lot of people become Muslims out of cupidity. <laughs> I'm like, come on, come on, right? But they're going around matchmaking and, you know, little angel here and little angel here, right? This little angel whispering, this little angel, and they're like, they're like the little fairy in, uh, in what is it, House in Wonderland? I'm not sure what it was. Tinkerbell, right? like Tinkerbell. Like angels in that, like Jibreen, Ali Sam, you want, are you serious? Are you serious? 600 wings. The Prophet I looked upon Jibreen, Ali Sam, he said, I looked east and west, north and south, I looked over the Ufuk, and he covered the entire horizons in his original forms. The entire horizons again. And he saw him manifested with his 600 wings. That was no hug. That was no hug. What kind of a hug leaves a person saying that I, uh, 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 that he, that he, uh, uh, that, that he, uh, uh, that he took me, he took me, أخذني. he took me, uh, until I was on the verge of breathing my last breath, ثم أرسلن. and then he let me go. Hmm? And that was three times that he did that, until I was on the verge of breathing my last breath. Until I was about to, until I was about to die. Great, great constriction. We will, will, we will cast upon you a very weighty word, a very heavy word. That was the night of constriction from the Prophet that led to the greatest expansion. But it was difficult. The revelation was very difficult for him in the very beginning. Very difficult to make sense of it. Was very difficult. It needed the tafsir of a of a Christian. Right, to confirm him. It needed that. Khadija and Waraka believed in the Prophet before the Prophet believed in himself. Before he believed in himself, they believed in him. So, Laylat al Qadri khayrun min al Fishar. تنزل الملائكة تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أن. The angels descend in me and the Lord by the permission of the Lord with every affair. With every affair. This is interesting. The ملائكة descend on this night with the permission of the Lord on every affair. I'd like to take a step back a little bit. After the after Laylat and Qadr, after those first five verses were revealed, and usually when the Prophet received his revelation, he would receive it in verses of five, five verses, right? Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, khalaqa l'insana min alaq, iqra wa rabbuka nakram, alladhi allama bin qalam, allama l'insana min alaq, five. He would usually get it in five. Sometimes he would get full surahs, you know, long surahs, but, uh, you know, many, many more verses than five. But usually when the verses would come down, they would come down in five, in fives. So after that was revealed to him, there was what is called fatrat in wahi, a lull in the revelation. And the Prophet ﷺ did not receive revelation for a good while after that. The, uh, the, um, some say three months all the way up until two years. But Al Bayhaqi says that six months was the uh, was the uh, the law, and most most scholars would agree with Al Bayhaqi that that is probably the the, the, the most accurate uh, uh, duration. So just imagine after Jibreel Islam comes to him, and that whole thing happens with Waraka, right? That for six months, for six months after that, nothing comes. For six months after that, nothing comes. The Prophet begins to feel that he has displeased Allah by doing something or neglecting to do something. That there is something that he is doing that has prohibited, prevented Jibreel from coming down again. Or from, for, for, for the Rebbe, I mean, he doesn't know, this is a six month memory. Just think, six months back, 
It's a very long time. What are we in now? April? We're in April? June. June? June. <laughs> so, where were you January 1st, 2018? And look how far back that was. Look how far back that was. Six months is a long time. And so he begins to feel that maybe I've done something to displease my Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him Surah al -Duha, as a consolation to his heart. Surah al -Duha. And in Surah al -Duha, he says, مَا وَدَّعْكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has not forsaken you, nor is he displeased. Nor is he displeased. After Jibreel recites Surah al duha to him, the Prophet ﷺ turns to him and he confesses and he says, لَقَدِ اشْتَقْتُ إِلَيْكَ According to Imam al-Razi, he says that I have missed you. And Jibreel A.S. responds saying, مَا حَبَسَنِي إِلَّا أَمْرُ رَبِّكَ That it was just the command of your Lord that withheld me from you. It was just the command of your Lord that kept me back from you. Ah. So what is Laylat al-Qadr? What is Laylat al-Qadr for the Prophet Such that six months go by and he's recounting that, reliving that experience of the cave for the past six months. For the past six months, he has not forgotten a detail of that visit in the cave. For the past six months, he's been, he's been obsessing about that encounter with Jibreel Salam in the cave. And how he held him, and how he revealed those verses, and how he just came out of nowhere, and how he just went right back. For six months, he couldn't let that go, obsessing over that memory, for six months. And so he led him to the end saying, I've missed you. Laylat al-Qadr for the Prophet Think back to the first time you ever laid eyes on your significant others. Think back to the first time you ever laid eyes on your wife or on your husband or on your first love. If it's not your wife or your husband today. <laughs> Think back to the first time you laid eyes on her or you laid eyes on him. Can you forget that? Can you forget that moment? Can you forget what she was wearing, what he was wearing? Can you forget the ambiance of the room? Can you forget the context of it? Can you forget the first time they looked back at you? Can you forget the first smile? It's vivid in your mind. Vivid. Well, what if you didn't know you were going to marry them at that point? <laughs> Leave that to the fuqaha. I'm talking about love here. I'm talking about love. Love at first sight. That's what I'm talking about. Do you remember? Do you remember? Everyone remember? And that's for a human being. What if your beloved was a bona fide angel? What if your beloved was an angel, straight up, an angel. And you have a relationship, the Prophet has relationships with men and women whom he loves. But to fall in love with an angel, later to Qadr for the Prophet was the night that commemorated the first time he ever laid eyes on his beloved. And they were on a first name basis. Jibreel A.S. was on a first name basis with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah does not call the Prophet by name. Out of, out of how we should exalt the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and out of the honor that he bestows on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Throughout his book he says, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. But Musa, he says, Ya Musa. Nudiya Ya Musa, Inna ka bilwaad al-muqaddasi Ibrahim, he says, Ya Ibrahim, 
أراغب أنت عن آلهتي يا إبراهيم يحيى هي سد يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة All of this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though the Ibrahim quote uh, is in the mouth of his father Allah states it Allah reveals it يا إبراهيم but يا نوس يا موسى يا إبراهيم يا نوح all, He calls them by their first names but the Prophet sallallahu he doesn't call him by his first name. The Prophet's wives never called him by his first name. His own wives called him Ya Rasulullah. Oh Ya Abul Qasim. They would call him by his kunya. His own wives didn't call him by his first name. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he comes in the hadith of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, which is known as the hadith Jibreel, hadith of Jibreel, بينما كنا جلوسا جلوسا عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اطلع علينا رجلا شديد بياض الشع ثيابي شديد سواد الشعر لا يرى عليه أثر السفر ولا يعرفه منا أحد فألبس فألبس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فوضع ركبتيه إلى فأسنى ركبتيه إلى ركبتيه ووضع كفيه على فخذيه فقال يا محمد while we were sitting in the presence of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was a man who came out of nowhere, the whitest of white clothes, the blackest of black hair. He didn't have a trace of travel upon him, and no one of us knew knew him before. And he was not familiar to any one of us, and so he put his knees before the knees of the Prophet and he put his palms on his thighs, and he says, "Ya Muhammad, O oh Muhammad." Tell me what is Islam until the end of the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ turns to those who were sitting as though birds were perched on their heads and he says, Ata'amuna ma sa'id. They said, do you, do you, He said, Do you know the, who this questioner was? They said, Allahu wa Rasulullah ala. He said, Dalikum Jibreel. Atakum yu'alimukum deenakum. That was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. First name basis. First name basis. And at the Siddhat al Munta at the low tree of the utmost periphery, the Prophet is told by his companion, he said, You go, because if you go, ikhtarakta, and if I go, ihtarakt. If you go, you will, you will penetrate, you will be able to enter. If I go, I will burn up. And so the Prophet turns to him and he says, so this is the place where every Khalil forsakes his Khalil. This is the place where every intimate friend forsakes his intimate friend. You know what Khalil is? Khalil, comes, Khalil is, is related to Khal, which is vinegar. You have all the properties of vinegar that are mixed up all into one so that you have just one substance. That's Khalil. Ibrahim is Khalilullah because his will was so intertwined with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they were inseparable. Whatever Allah willed, Ibrahim willed. And whatever Ibrahim willed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that. Khalilullah. He says, you're my Khalil. That's the highest level of friendship is Khalil. The highest level of friendship. And so he said, so this is the place where every Khalil abandons his Khalil and he enters into the Divine Presence. فَكَانَ قَوْلَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى and he was but two, two bold lengths or nearer still. وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى And he saw Jibreel alayhi salam at a second descent in full glory, 600 wings. So the night of Qadr for the Prophet sallallahu that was his anniversary. That was his anniversary. That was the anniversary of the first encounter of the night of the first encounter in which the Prophet fell in love. And that was a, that could have been a slip of the tongue on the Prophet. Because toward the end of his life, he says, Had I taken a Khalil from this creation, it would have been Abu Bakr. But his tongue got the better of him. Because in the Isa al Ma'raj, ten years before, he called Jibreel his Khalil. He called Jibreel his Khalil. That was his beloved. That was his beloved. And Laylat al Qadr was the night 
right? The anniversary of the night in which he first fell in love with his teacher, with his mentor, with his guardian and protecting angel, Jibreel Salam. And every anniversary is betokened by a gift. Every anniversary is betokened by a gift, is it not? The Prophet said, Rajabu Shahullah. Shahbanu Shahri. Wa Ramadan Shahru Ummati. Double take. What did he just say? Rajab is the month of Allah. Shahban is my month. And Ramadan is the month of my Ummah. You guys notice something there? What just happened? What just happened? Ramadan is the, is the month that hosts Laylatul Qadr. Ramadan is the month that hosts Laylatul Qadr, which is the night of the anniversary of the Prophet And every anniversary has a gift. And what is the gift of Laylatul Qadr? What is the gift of Ramadan? Who receives that gift? The Ummah. The Ummah receives that gift. The Prophet ﷺ gifts the Ummah, you and me, that which commemorates his anniversary with Jibreel ﷺ. He gifts it to his beloved. He is the beloved of Allah. He is our beloved, but we are also his beloved. We are the beloved of the beloved. Wallahi ma dhukira habibu ladan muhim bi illa wa'am hawali han nashwana Aina muhimbuna ladina alayhi mubadlu nufusi ma'an nafa'a zihana By Allah, the beloved is not mentioned in the presence of the lover except that he sacrifices drunk and out of his wits. Where are those types of, belover, of, of lovers who deem the sacrifice of all of their possessions and even their own souls yet insignificant? And so when you mention that, when you mention the Ummah to the Prophet he sacrifices. He gives of his most precious prized possessions. He gives of all of his possessions. He gives everything until he leaves this world with nothing to his name. Yet there was no man on earth richer than he was. But he gives, he gives, he gives. And especially during Ramadan, they say, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Ramadan. The Prophet was the most generous of all people and he was at his most generous during Ramadan. When Jibreel would come down to him and he would recite the Quran to him in Ramadan. And in his last Ramadan he came down and recited the Quran to him twice. So Ramadan for the Prophet was unlike any other month. Ramadan for the Prophet was what he was looking forward to all year round. Ramadan was something that, that the Prophet could not let go of. He couldn't let go of Ramadan and the special status of Ramadan. And that's why he fasted every Monday and Thursday. And that's why he fasted every white night, the days of the white night. That's why he fasted all of Sha'ban, just waiting for Ramadan to come, just to receive Ramadan having fasted Shaban. That's why he would fast the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. That's why he fasted Ashura. That's why when there's nothing in the, in the house to eat, he would say, I'm fasting. I am reliving all of Ramadan. I'm reliving what Ramadan has to offer. Ramadan continues out long after Ramadan. It's not about the month. It's about how the month, what the, what the month does to us and how the, how the month carries us throughout the year. That's Ramadan. And the Prophet ﷺ would not let go of it throughout the year. He couldn't let it go. The very first sunnah of the Muslim ummah, the very first sunnah of the Muslim ummah, on the day of Eid, is to neglect the Qur'an. Is to leave the Qur'an alone. And that guilt that we feel from missing the just, it's gone the day of Eid. You miss one juz during Ramadan, and you feel this guilt that I've got to be on. And, and then now you're going to read two juz or three just to stay ahead of the pace. 
just in case you miss another juz, you know, later on in the week, that I've got, I've got I, I'm ahead of myself. But where is that guilt on the day of Eid? Where is that guilt on the day of Eid? It's like Ramadan is the honeymoon for the believer. The honeymoon. And the day of Eid is the divorce. Ramadan is a honeymoon for the believer. And the day of Eid is the, is the great divorce. The irrevocable divorce. Three times divorced. Talak tukat, talak tukat, talak Not so with the Prophet they did some qadr for him. And then with that, with all of that, and with what we don't even know that was stirring in the Prophet's heart, what will make you understand and fathom the greatness of Laylatul Qadr? Allah asked the Prophet, what will, what will make you understand? What will make you fully grasp it? Tanazar al Going back to Surah al Duha, after Surah al Duha was revealed, the Prophet told Jibreel, I've missed you. And Jibreel responded, saying, Ma halasani illa amru rabbik. And then he quoted a verse that's not in Surah Al-Duha, it's in a different, I don't remember the, where it is in the Quran. He said, وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُوا إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ And we do not descend except by the command of your Lord. إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ We do not descend except by the command of your Lord. But what did Allah say in Surah Al-Qadr? He said, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا Well, بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ Not بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهِمْ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ That the angels and the ruh descend therein by the permission of their Lord, not by the command of their Lord. In the other verse, what did Allah say? What did Jibreel tell the Prophet He said that we don't descend except by the command of your Lord. We do not descend except by the command of your Lord. But here in Surah Al-Qadr he says that they descend and the Ruh descends by the permission of their Lord. What does that mean? Why not the command? Why not the command? Is that the ask it? This is exactly what Imam Abazi says. Is that the word permission here presumes that the angels requested from Allah subhanahu wa to be among us on Laylat al-Qadr every year. That during Ramadan, during Laylat al-Qadr, there is a yearning and a burning desire in the angels to be among us on the night that commemorates the anniversary of the Prophet and Jibreel They want to be among us to celebrate that anniversary. They want to be among us to celebrate that anniversary and bring the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and distribute them and be showered among the believers to be showered by all of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here on earth with us. They don't want to miss out. And so they have the permission of their Lord every Layat and Qadr to come down. They come down with the permission. وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا What's the Ruh? What's the Ruh? Hmm? Sayyidina Jibreel He's called the Ruh. فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا That we sent to her, Maryam A.S., our Ruh. And so he appeared before her as a man in all respects. And this is understood to be Sayyidina Jibreel A.S. It's understood to be Sayyidina Jibreel A.S. Hmm? But it could also be who else? The Ruh. Who is Ruh Allah? 
Sorry. He's fine, he's fine. According to Imam Marazi, so the scholars differ about this Ruach. We don't know who this Ruach is for certain. Right? Could be Sayyidina Jibreel, could also be Sayyidina Isa, who comes down from the infant Qadr by the permission of his Lord to be among the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu until his greatest second coming. But he has visits, he comes down and he visits according to this interpretation. And he is the Ruh of Allah. And we have to take a step back here. He is the Ruh of Allah just as the Prophet is the Rasul of Allah. Yeah. Huh? You guys got me? Right, so when we say Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, none of us is thinking essence that he shares in his essence. And when we say Isa Ruhullah, none of us is thinking about essence. And if you are thinking about essence, you've got to put Ruhullah in the same category, the same cognitive category as Rasulullah, as Naqatullah, as Kitabullah, as Kalimatullah. Right? The she camel of Allah, are you thinking essence? The kitab of Allah, are you thinking essence? The book of Allah, right? Kalimatullah, the word of Allah, are you thinking essence now? Okay, same thing with Ruhullah. And the reason Isa is called Ruhullah is because Allah possessed his ruh. His ruh belonged totally to Allah. There was no attachment to the world whatsoever. And that's why Masih al-Dajjal is just that. He will teach the exact opposite of what Sayyidina Isa uh, taught. He's the Antichrist. He will teach salvation through pure materialism. Whereas Isa al Islam taught, spirit, taught uh, salvation through pure spirituality. And he had no attachment to this dunya. He said, my legs are my beast of burden. The, 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 the moon is my lamp at night. The sun is my heat in the winter. I retire to the, for the night with nothing to my name. I arise in the morning with nothing to my name. Yet there is no man on earth richer than I am. They said he owned nothing but a comb and a cup. And so he saw someone combing his beard with his fingers. And he saw someone, someone else drinking from a stream with his hands. And so he gave away his comb and his cup in charity. They said one time that he was reclining and he had his head on a, on a rock. And Shaitan walked by and he said, I knew I could tempt you. I knew I could get you with the dunya. I knew that one day you would succumb. One day you would succumb to the comforts of this dunya. A rock. And so he took the rock and he hurled it at Shaitan and he said, Take that and the world with it. Ruh Allah. The spirit of Allah. Allah possessed his spirit. He possessed his ruh. And for that reason he was called Ruh Allah. Ruh and Minhu. Karimat Minhu. Ruhun, uh, what's the verse? Anyone know? Hmm? No, there's another verse. There's another verse. And I may be confusing. But this is Ruhullah. And so this is one of the other interpretations of the Ruh here. Tanazar al Malaikatu wa Ruhu fiha that Sayyidina Isa himself descends. And then another interpretation is that the Ruh is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah created and from that creature Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed into Adam his roar. Because when he says فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِي مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَجِدِينَ After I have fashioned him and breathed into him of my roar, at that point then what? Fall before him prostrated. So what is this roar? Ruhi. When I breathed into him of my ruh, what does that mean? Is that the essence? Are we thinking essence now? Again, it's creation. It's what Allah created. Allah created a ruh. And from that ruh, breathed into Adam his ruh. And Imam al-Zamakshari says, لا نفخ ولا منفوخ. That there was no breath and there was nothing breathed. There was no breath and there was nothing breathed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta'ala Allah wa Allah yasifun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent and exalted far above anything that we might ascribe to him. And so when he says, after I have breathed into him of my spirit, there's no breath, but this is the language of love. This is the language of love in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paints the image for us 
of these divine attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has infused into us to reflect his names and attributes. So that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that since, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahim, we also have Rahmah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Adl, we also have Adala. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Halim, we also have Ilm. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Sabur, we also have Sabur. Because Allah is Shakur, we also have Shukr. Because Allah is Wadud, we also have Wood. Right? To manifest and reflect the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala back to Him. And there's that hadith, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ That take upon yourselves, embody the traits of Allah. Embody in yourselves the traits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So this roar, from which Adam salam, gets his roar, and from which you and I get our roar, this is the roar that descends with the angels on Laylat al-Qadr. Comes down to be among us on Laylat al-Qadr. وَيُبَاهِ بِنَا رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ يُبَاهِ بِنَا رَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ When we stand uh, at Taraweeh, when we stand at Taraweeh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala boasts about us to the rest of the angels. He boasts about us and he gathers those angels together and he says, witness my servants. Behold. أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُ Did I not tell you that I know what you know not? Did I not tell you that I know what you know not? That day you questioned and you asked me, are you going to create therein one who will shed blood and sow mischief while we do celebrate your name and extol your praises? And I told you what? Didn't I tell you? I told you, I know what you know not. So now behold my, my, behold my, my servants, behold my slaves. Did I not tell you that I know what you know not? And that's in Taraweeh. نَزَلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ عَنْدِ On every affair. <coughs> so that by next year, it's already written who is going to make Hajj this year, who is going to die this year, who is going to be born this year, who is going to... All of that is decided. All of that is brought down and disseminated. So that this may be our very last Ramadan, Allah Alam. It is the last. It was the last Ramadan for uh, the many people that came before us. Right? Many people in our families didn't make it to this Ramadan, and that's because of the decree of Laylat al-Qadr last year that they would not make it this year. Salam. What is salam? What is salam? Peace. What is salam? Hmm? Peace? We have, for the first time in all of Muslim history, we have unanimous agreement. Full consensus. No disagreement. Rejoice. <laughs> peace, salam is peace. Salam is wholesomeness, it's soundness. Yawma la yanfa'u ma'arun wa la banun illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. So I just broke the consensus. <laughs> right? The day in which neither wealth nor sons will avail them of anything save such as come before Allah Taala with what? The qalbin salim with a sound heart. The word salim here is related to salam. Soundness. It's soundness, it's wholeness, it's oneness, it's perfection. Allah is as salam. Allah is as salam. Hmm? It's perfect. Something that is in a state of salam is, is free of any deficiency, free of any fault. It's whole and it's sound, it's perfect, it's complete. Salam. 
Salam Khaulim Mirabur Rahim, a statement from the compassionate word Lord, Salam. <coughs> and this can only and, and this and this this salam, this salam can only be reached, can only be attained to once we have Islam, full submission, full submission to Allah subhanahu wa full submission to Allah subhanahu wa with our intellects, with our hearts, with our spirits, to be fully in submission to Allah subhanahu wa Then we will have soundness in ourselves. Then we will be whole with ourselves. And the result of that is that we will be in a state of what? Of peace, tranquility, serenity. Mm -hmm. That's the result. Peace is salam, right? but it's the result of having submitted ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's all connected. Islam needs to salam. And there can be no salam without Islam. Udukhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into submission entirely. This until the rise of dawn. What a beautiful surah. What a beautiful surah. And about Ayat al Qadr, the Prophet was going to tell us when the night was, when the anniversary was. He was going to tell us. And then he came out and he found the Sahaba squabbling about it, arguing about it, back and forth, differing about it. So he told us, He said, seek it out in the last ten nights. Seek it out when? In the last ten nights. And he didn't tell us when it would be. To teach us a great lesson. That if you want the peace of this one, that you cannot have peace when there is bickering. You cannot have peace when there is dissension, when there is disagreement, when there is arguing back and forth. You cannot attain to peace. Salam and hiyahatta nutra al fajr. That's one of the distinctions of Laylat al Qadr. And if you're going to argue about Laylat al Qadr, then what portion of salam will you have when it brings you salam? And so he said, Fatubuha fil ashin al akhir. So seek it out in the last ten nights. And in another hadith, it's in the odd nights of the last ten nights. But the interesting thing is, <coughs> the Muslim community is divided in terms of when we start the month. You have half of us who go by calculations, may Allah guide us. And you have the other half of us who go by naked eye sighting, may Allah preserve us. <laughs> Oh yeah, I went there. <laughs> huh? So every night of the last ten nights is an odd night. <laughs> huh? Every night is an odd night. Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik he had specific clothing that he designated just for Laylat al-Qadr. And he believed Laylat al-Qadr was on the 25th. And he would take out these clothing, he would don them for Laylat al Qadr, and then after the night uh, passes, he would fold them up and put them back and not touch them until the next year. Khuluzina to command the Kuni Masjid. Adorn yourself at every masjid. What is a masjid? Hmm? It's, it's a house of God. Any other answers? Place where you make sujood, you study the Arabic. Yeah. Okay, is it just that? Is it just a place where you make sujood? Huh? That's right. That's right. It's naf'il. And naf'il is ism zaman and ism makan. It's every place of sujood and it's every occasion of sujood. It's every place of sujood and it's every occasion of sujood. Right? that you are to adorn yourself in that state. It's every, everywhere you make sujood and every time you make sujood. To take, to take on your, to put on your, to put on your Sunday best. 
Huh? You guys know about your Sunday best? Huh? It's not your Sunday best. It's your Sunday best, it's your Monday best, it's your Tuesday best, it's your Wednesday best, it's your Thursday best, it's your Friday best, it's your Saturday best. Because you are prostrating all of those days. You are prostrating all of those days. You know? So it's not just the place of worship, it's the time of worship. To be in your Sunday best, to be in your best clothing. Right? And this really refers to, to the men and not the women. I mean, the women are always dressed as though they belong in the masjid. <laughs> I mean, you guys are just always dressed in your Sunday best. The men, if we had to categorize the men, there would be about five or six different categories that men fall into. Uh -huh. If we're talking about the way that men dress at every place of sujood and every occasion of sujood, men fall into about five or six different categories. Right? And you know what those categories are? Wajib, Mustahad, Mubah, Makru, Haram. And the sixth one is Wajib or Fat, if you're Hanaf. If you get that, then I'm glad you appreciate it. Okay? So, the way we dress, right? The way we dress, if it's, if it's you don't even have to know you don't even have to have the calendar in front of you to know that it's Sabbath. If you live in a community where you've seen Jews going to the synagogue on Saturday, so they're like, yeah, today's Saturday. It must be Sabbath. It must be Saturday. Today's the Sabbath. How do you know that? Because of the way that they dress when they go to the synagogue. Huh? And you don't. You can you can lose track of the days, but if you see Christians going to church. Say, oh, today must be Sunday. Why? Because of the way they dress when they enter that house of worship. What gives Juma away? What gives Juma away? Pardon. How do people know that? That's a dead giveaway. Oh, it must be Juma. <laughs> but it's not the way we dress. That's the point I was trying to get to. It's not the way we dress. Because we will come into those doors dressed in all kinds of funky ways. We will come into those doors dressed, uh, I mean, dressed like we were, dressed like we just got up out of bed sometimes. Come into Juma in our sweatpants. Just like we got off the, uh, just like we started, just like we, we came out of the YMCA. After, after working out or playing basketball, the YMCA, coming in with shorts, right? Just like we were at a baseball game or something like that, with all the paraphernalia, all the, all the advertisement. That's the way we come into the masjid. Khudu zina taqumenda kundi masjid. Allah subhanahu wa said, zina taqum, right? And Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had zina just for for Laylat al Qadr. He had, seen, he had, a, he had a, 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 an outfit that he wore just for Laylat al Qadr. Woman, you have them sha'ir Allah, for inna min taqwa al qulub. Whoever exalts the symbols of Allah, that is directly from the taqwa in the hearts. <clears throat> so look for it in the last 10 nights. Some of the scholars said that it moves year after year. That if it's the 27th, it's not the 27th every year. That it may be the 27th this year. Next year it might be the 21st. The year after that it might be the 29th. The year after that it might be the 23rd. Why is that? Because I am time. I control night and I control day. And if I want the 29th to be the night that we celebrate the anniversary of the Prophet with his beloved, then so be it on that day. Uh, on that year. If I want to change it the next year, I'll change it the next year. And so they said, well, since that's the case, Laylat al-Qadr could be any of the nights of Ramadan. It could move in any of the nights of Ramadan. Fatubuha fi Ramadan. So seek it out throughout all of Ramadan. Seek it out. And if that's the case, then it could be any night throughout the entire year. Laylatul Qadr could be outside of Ramadan. 
And this is what informs the Sudanese proverb. They say, Kullu Laylatun, Laylatul Qadr. Every night is Laylatul Qadr. And the next person you lay eyes on, that's Sayyidina Al Khidr. To live in that spiritual space, to, to, to be present in that, to have that presence that every night could treat every night as though it was made at al Qadr. And so Allah let's let's say that at least once a day, at least once a night, because that could be Layat al Qadr. To push ourselves every night. You know? And especially during Ramadan. Especially during Ramadan. From the Nusus that we have, the text that we have. Right? But it shows the posture that we should have toward our Lord and the exaltation that we have for Layat al Qadr that we never forget this night, and they would treat every night as though this could be the night. Oh Allah, if this is the night, deprive me not of his blessings. And the next person you meet could be Sayyidina Khidr, they said. Meaning the next person you meet could be, the, could be the greatest teacher. The next person you meet, they could give you lessons that Sayyidina Khidr was giving to the Musa, those same lessons if our hearts are open to receiving those lessons. If we're not looking for the, the, the long garment here, the hat, the long beard, <coughs> because Sayyidina Khidr could be that 80-year-old woman bagging your groceries. That could be Sayyidina Khidr. The next, the, it could be the guy pumping your gas. That could be Sayyidina Khidr. He doesn't even have to be Muslim. <coughs> because in Hikmatul Dalat al Mu'min, Aina ma wajadah fawa'ah kubiya. That wisdom is the lost property of the faithful. Wherever, wheresoever they find it, they are more entitled to it. Meaning that wisdom could come from any quarter. And who knows? Who knows? That could be Sayyidina Khidr. You know, so, uh, these are meanings that, inshallah, that we take with us, we carry with us, we take, we, 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 we focus on these meanings here in Ramadan, right? But we, it behooves us to question, to ask the question, Ya Allah, why did you make a month of abstinence? Why did you make a month of fasting? And turn that into a pillar of a religion, of the religion that you revealed. You took a month and you turn that you made that into a pillar upon which this religion stands, without which the entire religion would collapse. You take a building, a high rise building, and put it on five pillars, and then you break down one of those pillars. What happens to your building? Where what is Islam without Ramadan? What is this religion without the pillar of Ramadan? Arkan. These are Arkan. So what is it about Ramadan that makes it a pillar? And is it just for the month? Is it just for the 30 days? For the 29 days? Is it just for that? <clears throat> it's training for the whole year. That's it. That's it. And with that, SubhanAllah, wa bihamdik, wa shiru illa 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 anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayka. والعصر إن الإنسان في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا الحق وتواصلوا الصبر. We have some time for reflections, some time for uh, questions, or uh, anything you'd like to share about the month, and, uh, or, or anything that you have on your mind. Another question: uh, Have you had any reflection on the fact that in Nabi Muhammad the Father has said three times in the surah? I was hearing someone talk about it and saying that that also connects to the idea that there's three Qadrs every month. On the 9th, on the 18th, I guess because 1 plus 8 is 9, and then on the 27th, Interesting. 2 plus 7. Okay. I, don't, I don't, I'm not sure having trouble recalling what you're saying exactly. Mashallah. Okay. Yeah, I, I've never heard of that. Uh, these, these are uh, I, these are interesting insights that uh, people will have. 
Uh, but I, I have not I heard that. I haven't heard it uh, uh, confirmed or, or... So you're saying what now? The, the first, the 8th, and what now? Or what is it? It's the 9th, 18th, the 27th. Oh, if you, if you divide it according to 3? Yeah. The 27 knock. And so what are those three colors? I guess it's kind of, I think what you're saying, that other could be any night. I look for other throughout the year. No, I don't know. So yeah, I, 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 I hadn't heard that there. Yes? So, um, you mentioned how <coughs> the meaning of Qadr, uh, qadr as uh, restriction or constriction. Constriction. Constriction, yeah. how it's relevant. No. Also, decree. How is the meaning of decree? Yes. I'm wondering if you could talk about how the meaning of Qadr as power, how that is relevant to the entire discussion. No. So, Qadr is power, and Qadr is related to it. And Qadr is related to it. And obviously, when Allah SWT decrees, now there is the will and there is the power. Right? There is Irada and there's Qudra, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, uh, has the power to uh, bring into existence that which He wills, um, that which He decrees. So it's not the, uh, so the decree comes down, but then also it's the, the manifestation of that decree, uh, it comes forth through His Qudra, through His power. Uh, so, so the decree comes down, who is going to reach next Ramadan? Right? And that comes down later to Qadr, it's disseminated. Right? Who is going to reach the next Ramadan? And then the Qudra no, uh, brings that decree to manifest, such that next Ramadan, you and I, inshallah, are here. And that is the Qudra of Allah SWT, that He has sustained our life so that we are able to reach the next Ramadan. No. Does that help? Yes, and also, I mean, even though the, the, the Rat al Qadr is the nine that the Prophet Salaam first received the first revelation. But I've also heard that the nine that it descended into the Quran is the Lah al Mahfud. So is there a relation between it? Did it descend right now the Mahfud and immediately Malay came down to I mean teach the first few verses of it? Now, so the, the, uh, you have uh, inzal and, and, and tanzeev, <coughs> right? And these two verbs are used, or they, these masdar, they're used in the Qur'an uh, uh, um, in various contexts. Inzal is the Qur'an's coming down all at once, from the, uh, from the uh, lawh al-mahfud to, uh, to the lowest of the heavens. Yeah? Uh, and then uh, Tanzim is that is Jibreel is bringing verses over a span of 23 years, right? So, right, so Tanzim is more it's, it's more emphatic, it's not emphatic but it's uh, it's uh, uh, it uh, implies uh, a, a process, right? It implies a uh, continuation of something, Nazala, right? Uh, so so if uh, uh, so but Inzal is a, that it comes down at once, right? No. Yes. Any of the women have questions or comments? No. Okay. Just one question. Can you uh, provide some more context around uh, the weather changes? That the night becomes slightly cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Some sort of rain. Or yeah, these are these are all uh, signs that are mentioned in the hadith, um, and um, the uh, the uh, one is that the sun will come with without uh, the, the the sun will come uh, as a disc. You'll see the sun in, 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 uh, without the um, what was called the sambra. The sambra will be dimmed, uh, and that the, there will be a peace uh, that that that, um, that would, the sun will rise like that. That's one of the signs. But I think what's more important uh, is that Laylat al Qadr uh, is one of the most important signs. Is that Laylat al Qadr is the day in which the Prophet first met his beloved, first fell in love, first met his teacher. And for a lot of people, I think Laylat al Qadr will be personalized. 
It's the day where you fell in love with Allah subhanahu wa It's the day where you gave yourself totally to Allah subhanahu It's the day that you totally, you completely connected to Allah subhanahu So the Yad Qadr could be, in the words of the teachings of some of our ulama, they say that people have their own personalized Layat Qadr as well. And so one should really focus on that much more than focusing on trying to uh, see uh, in the heavens and in the, in the horizons uh, was it tonight? Was it tonight? The purpose is the purpose of Layat al-Qadr is to make the night your Layat al-Qadr. You see what I'm saying? To, to have your personal, intimate connection with Allah on that night, uh, and leave the signs of the heavens to uh, as signs in the heavens. Uh, to take to take uh, lessons from them, but but um, to be more concerned with with making every night your personal Layat al-Qadr with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You just said right now, it just touches touches me very much. Mm-hmm. It's as because when you mentioned it's better than a thousand nights, and you said months. eighty-three years, a uh, month, yeah. sorry, and eighty-three years, it's a lifetime. So a whole lifetime can be summed up in a night that you can fall in love with. Oh, Allah, 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 Allah. And so if it's if it's if it's tonight for you, then tonight is your night. That's the beautiful thing about it. And this is one of the things that Imam Malik, if I uh, go going into a little bit about this, the, the, the whole thing about Tarawih, um, in the Maliki Madhab, Imam Ma- the, the Tarawih is considered, and perhaps in other Madhab as well, is considered Fard Kifaya. Mm-hmm. It's not Fard it's Fard Kifaya. Uh, it's a Sunnah, you could say a Sunnah Kifaya, right? Um, uh, that's not a, a legal term, by the way, but uh, it's, it, it should be. Uh, established, but he preferred to pray tarawih in his own home, right, and not to pray it in Jamaat, because for him uh, it wasn't about finishing the juz, doing a whole khatam al It wasn't about the quantifiable um, uh, approach that we have to tarawih. It was about connecting to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and making every night your layat al qadr with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? Making every night your night that you connect to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? So that, that, that's the point of it, that's the point. It's very good that you have khatam of the Qur'an, very good. Right? But the whole point, like I mentioned before, that you're, sometimes you're, a, lot of, lots of, a lot of us have a khatam in tarawih, and we have a khatam outside of tarawih as well. We're doing our own khatam, right? And the very first communal sunnah, like we mentioned before, right? the very first communal sunnah is that the day of Eid, any guilt over missing our juz goes from our heart. You know, we don't have any guilt. That guilt is gone from our hearts. Right? So, did we have a Laylat al-Qadr or did we not? Right? Did, we, did we have that moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month or did we not? And for Imam Malik, the, the, um, the uh, emphasis was far greater that he put much, much more emphasis on having a personal connection, even if it means that you don't even go to the masjid and you have your prayer at home, but you have your prayer. And, and you have that prayer, you establish that prayer with Allah subhanahu wa and you establish those moments with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was his, that was his uh, preference. And that was based on the amin of the people of Medina. It wasn't at all, not all of the tabayin were in the masjid. But it was it was going on. I mean, the tarawih was being established, but it wasn't the way that we sort of um, you know overemphasize it. And we're standing behind the imam, and either we're connecting or we're not. Uh, for Imam Malik, it was much more important to have that connection, yeah. even if you're not going to finish your khutbah, uh, your khatam, but but to recite the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and to connect to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through that recitation, even if that recitation is but a few verses. Or a couple of surahs. Right? The whole point is is connecting. Do you know when Ramadan was being established, and obviously some of the rules changed that you couldn't just pay to have a Ramadan made up. You have to actually make it up later. Um, and then it was, I think it was on. You mean if you deliberate? You missed the fast. Deliberate, deliberately break your fast. Yeah. And then I guess it was also Ramadan was the hottest month of the year for the Arabs. And then, but then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says something about we've made Ramadan fasting easier for you. Do you have any comments around that? Like, obviously it was selected to become harder, but was it easier because everyone else was doing it? Well, I, uh, so th- 
when the Arabs were naming the months, uh, the original name of Ramadan was Nataq, and uh, Shawwal was Wa'il. Uh, they changed the month, uh, when they changed the months, they would change them at the time that the months would come in, right? So every month got a name um, that was based on the time of the, of the year in which they decided to change the, the names. And this predates the Prophet So they noticed in Ramadan that it had never been as fiercely hot throughout the year, so they, that they knew that this was their August. <laughs> we call it whatever. For the hottest month of the year is probably August or July. Right? So it must have been July when Ramadan came in that month. And, they, and they, this was the month where camels, right, every third word in Arabic has to do with camels or not. <laughs> That's a qaida, nugawiyya. That's a qaida. That's a linguistic principle. Um, I'm being facetious. <laughs> so uh, they noticed that, the, um, that this was the month where their hooves were burning. Right? Their, 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 hooves, their hooves would burn. Uh, in this month, and they, they would get callous and blisters, and uh, so they noticed that. So they, so they called it Ramadan, which is the month of burning. Mm -hmm. And for the believer, it's a great metaphor because this is the month in which sins are burned away. Right? Uh, it's the month uh, in which uh, all of our sins are burned to ashes. And then the next month after that, they noticed that um, uh, the udders of the camels again, and the sheep, and the cattle uh, were empty and the young did not have enough milk to drink from their udders, right? And so they called it Shawwal, right? Tashunu fihi al-ban, right? That this is when the milk was, uh, was, was not there. And Shawwal means to be vacated, right? To be purged. There's, no, there's nothing there. And so for the believer, again, this is a great metaphor that after all the sins are burned up, right? There's nothing there in Shawwal. Clean slate in Shawwal. You have a clean slate. That, 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 that it's, it's, uh, there, there's, no, there's nothing in your vessel of sins that's been totally emptied. Right? There's an emptying out in Shawwal. Uh, and so uh, with that, there's great ease, obviously. And uh, Ramadan is not always in July. Right? Uh, we're in June now. Next year is going to be May. And whatnot, right? So, so the the taysir that you're referring to that comes throughout the month, throughout the year, depending on when Ramadan is being established, and also uh, the, uh, the, the the with every hardship there is ease, with every hardship there is ease, uh, uh, and uh, this is the promise of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So there is a hardship of Ramadan, right? but that is met with great ease as well in the month, and you find that like you alluded to, the fact that we're all doing it together, there's a great ease in that, right? There's a great ease in it. Just imagine if you were doing Ramadan on your own. Just imagine if you were doing iftar on your own. Like a lot of converts, they don't have a place to go to for iftar, right? Very difficult, very difficult. For, for, so for most Muslims, doing Ramadan in a community uh, or with family, right, there's a great ease in that. There's a great ease in that. Uh, so these are just some reflections on what you just said. <coughs> Okay, there doesn't have to be questions or comments, we could just close now. I have a quick question. So are all sins forgiven or only minor sins? I read somewhere that only minor sins are forgiven. No. So the Prophet said, As-salawatu al-khams, wa jumatu ila juma, wa ramadanu ila ramadan, mukaffiratu ma baynahunna, ila ishtunibat al-kabar. Right, so from the Prophet directly, he said that every one of the five prayers, right, uh, the, the, the one Jummah to the next, one Ramadan to the next, is an expiation for all of the sins, if the cardinal sins are avoided. Right, which means that, okay, just by praying, I'm forgiven for all of the minor sins between this prayer and the, and the past prayer. Right? I don't even have to make tawbah for those. I'm forgiven just by virtue of praying. I'm forgiven for that. You know? By virtue of attending one Jummah and then the next Jummah, all those sins that I had accumulated in that week, right, those minor sins, 
I don't even have to make tawbah for those. So what happens then? What about the cardinal sins? Jum'ah does not erase the cardinal sins. The prayers do not erase the cardinal sins. The, uh, the, the Ramadan does not erase the cardinal sins. Hajj, right? Even Hajj, you have to redress the wrong. Right? You have to redress the wrong. If there's a wrong that, that involves the rights of others, you have to redress that. Right? And, and uh, with all of these, right, with all of these, Hajj, Ramadan, fasting, uh, praying, uh, the cardinal sins require tawbah. They require repentance. Right? They require sincere repentance. And the tawbah does not have to be for, uh, for every sin. You could make a, a, a general tawbah for all of your sins, minor and major. And it's good adab to have with Allah SWT, even though prayers erase minor sins, to, to make tawbah for those minor sins. Right? For those minor sins. And not to distinguish. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ just described the believer. He said the believer is, is the one who sees um, his sins he sees the most minor of his sins like it's a mountain getting ready to crush him. And the hypocrite is the one who sees the greatest of his sins as though it were a fly coming to his nose and so he brushes it away. Yeah. So the proper etiquette to have with Allah SWT is to make tawbah for all sins. But the meaning of that hadith is that Ramadan will cover all the minor sins from last Ramadan. As long as you do tawbah everything. Tawbah for the major sins. Toba for the major sins is required. Do, do a quick um, a review of the major sins. Oh, no, no, there's the, so so that's another question, right? That the, 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 the um, scholars of theology have differed about major and minor, uh, the distinction between the major and minor, uh, such that you know um, you have uh, some scholars who would mention that there were two hundred major sins, and some would say no, there there are just seven, and some you know so there uh, you know do you have a big spectrum for what's considered major. Um, some of the signs for the major sins, though, are, are the, uh, for, for the distinctions after going through all of the texts, uh, scholars have devised lists for how we can um, uh, identify a sin as being major or minor. And uh, some of that is if the word haram has been used, if, there, if it uh, uh, concerns the rights of others, if it um, uh, if, if there is a punishment assigned to it, right? Something like that. These, these are sort of distinctions, right? That, uh, uh, or if Allah SWT uses certain words, right? like kabura, kabura maqtan, right? That, that's a major sin. Um, or uh, certain imagery, like, uh, uh, like Allah SWT says, أَيُّحِبُ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا Wouldn't you, would you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? Okay, that's a major sin now. It's a major sin, and because of the, the, the gravity of the image that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is um, is uh, revealing here, right? So these are signs that you're dealing with and that, that there's a line that's been crossed between minor and major. Right? But to have tilde for all sins is the is the best and the best way to go. Um, can you explain taqwa in more detail and kind of like a non-Muslim taqwa? Taqwa, no. Taqwa is an interesting word. Uh, uh, Allah SWT uh, has prescribed fasting in order that we have taqwa. Right? Uh, taqwa is an interesting How would you guys translate taqwa? What is a good translation for taqwa? God consciousness. God consciousness, huh? Mm. It comes from like the taqwa, which is about protection, right? To protect oneself. Protect you. Cautiously. Caution. Right? What else? So it's interesting that uh, that uh, God consciousness was the first definition, and I would wager to say that God consciousness was probably the first word that came across a lot of people's minds here. Am I wrong? Who was thinking God consciousness first? That's mm -hmm. most of the translations that are. And a lot of the translations are God consciousness, and that's because the translations are written with a certain audience in mind in a certain cultural context where uh, certain words are buzzwords for, um, for uh, spiritual abuse, perhaps, and also where there is a desire to win over the reader uh, according to their own sensibilities uh, in a way that is inviting and not warding off. 
there are certain words that uh, religious terms <coughs> that uh, that we are very uncomfortable using, and that's because we have applied political correctness to the translations of our words, to our own conceptions of those words. Right? You cannot use the word guilt anymore. Guilt is a no-no, uh, and to guilt someone is one of the worst things that you can do spiritually to a person. Uh, whereas it is a condition for tawbah. <laughs> True tawbah that is, that is uh, lacking in, in guilt is, 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 you're, is challenge play. You're, you're playing around. You're, you're not sincere. Part of sincerity is that the first step of, of having sincere tawbah nasuha, sincere tawbah is nada, nadana, guilt or, or, or regret over, or over what was done or remorse, right? So, uh, this, you know, Lewis, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Death of Satan. There was a man who wrote a book called The Death of Satan. Very, very good book that I recommend, where he talks about the, arch the, the passing of, so so of words into archaic usage in our own time. Satan himself, you can't use that word anymore. The Death of Satan, right? You can't, you, you can't use the word evil, right? Evil doesn't, you, we don't speak, we don't use that word. It's dropped from our vocabulary, right? Uh, uh, sin is another one of these words. You can't use the word anymore. If you use the word in a conversation, you you obvi you automatically feel that you have otherized yourself, right? That you that you don't. That I know I don't really belong in this conversation, right? I use the word sin. Now you now you have this certain impression about me that I'm just going to go and crawl back into my hole. I don't belong in this conversation anymore. I've sort of excluded myself. Right? I'm not cool anymore. So, <coughs> taqwa is not God consciousness, right? Dhikr is God consciousness. Yeah. A good translation for the word dhikr is God consciousness. And not even remembrance, right? The remembrance of God, right? Uh, you know, I'm going to remember God a thousand times. I'm going to remember God a hundred times. I've got my sipani. I'm going to remember God. You, you don't need to remember God a hundred times unless you're forgetting God a hundred times. If, if you forget God a thousand times, you need to remember Him a thousand times. But God consciousness is dhikr, right? To be conscious of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's a better word for that's, that's a, that's a word would be connected to that? Tadakkur is to remember. Okay. Tadakkur, right? Tadakkur. Tadakkur is to remember something you've forgotten. Right? But dhikr, dhikr means, literally it means to mention. To mention God. And we mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our tongues and we mention Him in our hearts. So, so it's, it's, it's closer to God consciousness than any other word. Taqwa means to, um, like, like, when, when, like when, when that man went to Sayyidina Umar ibn Umar and he said, Ittaqillah, right? And Sayyidina Umar ibn Umar begins to cry. How did Sayyidina Umar understand that word? That's what the word means. He begins to weep. He's a he's a he's a mirror mu'minin at this point. He's a mirror mu'minin, and the man comes up to him out of the blue, out of nowhere. Right? There's this man who comes out of nowhere and he says, it right? And he begins to weep. Did he tell him, have God consciousness? Is that is that how Omar Radhanu understood that? Does he mean have God consciousness? When the Prophet says, Ittakunara wala bishaqi tamra. Does that mean uh, have consciousness of the fire even if with half a date? Does that make any sense? I'm going to be conscious of the fire with half a date. <laughs> what does it mean then? What does it mean? Uh, what does the word come from? What's the root of taqwa? Yeah, exactly. Wa waqaf, yeah, waqaya. It's to take, right? You, it's as though you were taking between yourself and your Lord a protection, a waqaya, right? It's as though you were protecting yourself from Allah, through Allah. وَفِرُّوا مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ right? And flee from Allah to Allah. That's taqwa, right? It's to, to protect yourself from Allah, <coughs> through Allah. Mm. Mm? So, so it's, it's, and it's to protect yourself from the fire through half a date. So you're taking half a date and you're making that half a date as a barrier between yourself and the fire. 
as a protection, as a shield or a guard between yourself and the fire. And this was this is just in the language, right? And then Abdullah bin Mas'ud, uh, or it may have been Abu Huraira, who was asked about taqwa. And he asked the person, he said, have you ever walked home on a pitch black night? He said, yes. He said, how did you walk home? He said, I picked up my loincloth, another word that belongs only to Muslims. <laughs> that belongs to us. We own that word. Right? We own that word. We have exclusive rights to that word. And I try to use that word at least twice a week in conversation. <laughs> I challenge you to do the same. What's the way you use that? You got you to figure that out. <laughs> so he, he said, I, I, would draw, I would draw my loincloth, right? I would pick up my loincloth and make sure I don't step on any thorns or on any shards of glass or whatever, anything in the way. So, so I'm protected from harm's way. He said, Dali ka taqwa. He said, That's taqwa. That is taqwa. So it's to. <clears throat> and, the, the definite, the ulama would define taqwa in different ways. There are different levels of the taqwa, right? Uh, but they would say that the true muttaqi is the one who yatsuku al kathir min al mubah. He leaves off much of what is permissible. He leaves off. He leaves off what? Much of what is permissible. He leaves off all of what is impermissible. All of what is haram, all of what is makru, and much of what is mubah. Right? Lest he fall into the makru. Right? Like an example of that is a person who, you know, it's permissible for you and I to have a conversation. Right? But let that conversation go beyond five minutes into ten, and then from ten minutes into thirty, and then from thirty minutes into an hour, and then from an hour into two hours. <laughs> Am I as on guard after two hours of our conversation as I am at the very beginning? Mm -hmm. Or is it very much, is it after I've established this conversation with you, is it easier for me to say after two hours what I would have been ashamed to say after two minutes? Mm -hmm. So even though the, the, the talk is permissible, right, I'm going to leave off much of it, right, when I know that, okay, now I'm getting into it. Now, now, now this permissibility is leading me somewhere. Right. That's taqwa. But what about the idea that Quran kind of like halal and mutaqeen? Um, I think that's what probably she's asking too. Because like obviously we're Muslims and Quran is a guidance for us. But Quran is a guidance for all of mankind. So who would be like the one who could potentially get guidance? Is someone who inherently has this desire to protect? and proceed cautiously, knowing that life's not just about following whims, which could be just something innate into them without knowing anything about revelation. Allah SWT says that, يَهْدِي مِي كَثِيرًا وَيُذِنُّ مِي كَثِيرًا وَيُذِنُّ مِي كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي مِي كَثِيرًا That He misguides many people with the Qur'an, and He guides many people with the Qur'an. No? So, uh, the, the Qur'an is used to guide and misguide. Allah SWT <laughs> misguides with the book. Right? So, those who are guided then, he called them the first and muttaqeen, right? But an al fadl il ijtama'at if tarakat, where if tarakat is ijtama'at. When words are used in, used in isolation, they tend to take on inclusive meanings. And when they are used in juxtaposition, they take on exclusive meanings, right? So if muttaqeen is used just on its own, then it has a very vast, you know, it, it's an umbrella word for muslimin, mu'minin, muhsinin, salihin, Siddiqin, Sabirin, Qanitin, it's going to include everyone, right, under that. Basically, Muslimi, right, Muslimi. Uh, all those who are submitted to Allah SWT, that it's a guidance for those who submit. Uh, but when uh, taqwa is used, like if you say, if you, like in that verse, Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitat, until the, like, now these words have very specific meanings because they're mentioned all in the string, on the series, right? in, 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 in close uh, juxtaposition to other words. Right? Now they have very specific meanings, whereas if they're used in isolation, they have very broad and general meanings. Taqabba Allah, salatu salatu
دعاء لكم ان شاء الله في هذا الشهر المبارك اكثر من ذكر من قولي اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعفو عنا. That is something that we should not say. Lady Aisha, she asked the Prophet what should be the dua of Layat al Qadr. And he said uh, to her, he says, Allahumma innaka afuwa, tuhibbul afwa, fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are ever pardoning. You love to pardon, so pardon us. And in another narration, Allahumma innaka afuwa, ka'imun, tuhibbul afwa, fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are part, ever pardoning, generous. Uh, you love to pardon, so pardon us. So this is something we should all memorize if we don't have it memorized, and we should say it, repeat it very often, especially in these last ten nights, at least a hundred times. Try to do it a hundred times. Uh, at different times of the night, inshallah. Uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this Ramadan like no other, inshallah. And I mean, the Prophet said, Whoever's two days are equal, he has deluded himself, he has deceived himself. So what do you think about whoever's two Ramadans are equal? If this Ramadan is like last Ramadan, right, then we are in a major, major uh, delusion, right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this in, uh, the, uh, the most transformative Ramadan ever. And uh, one of the uh, signs of that is how we carry the month forward into the next month, into the next, uh, and then into the next month after that, into the next month. What are the traces of Ramadan, inshallah? What are the traces of Ramadan in the next month after that? And the next month? Where are those traces? Alhamdulillah. Allah, I'm going to you.